All right. Yeah. So we looked at uh, um, yeah. So we started with uh, John chapter sixteen, where we said that Jesus is warning them about the persecution to come. He's warning them about the opposition to come, and. In this passage, you know, we will continue to see more about the work of the Holy Spirit as well. Uh, so he has already painted a picture of the Holy Spirit and he's going to add to that. Uh, so he says that uh, he will go away uh, to him who sent me. So Jesus is, you know, earlier he said, I'm from above. Uh, and uh, he gave the, gave the indication to the disciples as well as the listeners, um, uh, even if they were Pharisees or people from other uh, other walks of life, he made it clear that he was fully God. Okay, that uh, his original address is not the earth. So he has mentioned that many times. It's part of one of the, the, the claims of Jesus. He's claiming, I'm deity. I've come from heaven okay, to live with all of you. And you would see again and again uh, in, in what he's telling his disciples. He says, I'm going back to the Father. I'm going back to him. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I go away. I will come again. So where, what place is he talking about? He's talking about heaven. He's talking about the uh, presence you know, along with the father. Uh, he said, in my father's house are many mansions. Father's house. So his original place, you know, we, we know, right? As Philippians 2 says, he left behind his heavenly glory and he became a human being for a, uh, a certain amount of time here. Okay, before he died. And yes, of course, after that, he received a resurrected body. And again, he ascended up into heaven and he is in heaven. He will come back to receive the uh, saints. So Jesus, his original address uh, is heaven. So you would find him say this many times, I go away to him, I go to the father. Okay, so you know what to understand when you read that. Okay. Uh, and now he, he adds to the comforting words. He says that uh, he says the truth to his disciples uh, that you know they will be experiencing sorrow. But you know here is a here is a uh, very encouraging thought that uh, it is it is for their advantage that he goes away. Okay, it is for their advantage that he goes away or goes away go back to the father uh, because if he does not go to the father then. What will not happen? Helper will not come to you. But if he goes away, the Holy Spirit or the Alos Paracletos, he will come to us and he will be sent to us. When he comes, you know, we already saw he's a spirit of truth. He's a spirit who teaches us. What else is he going to do? You know, his function will be that he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness and of judgment so basically the work of the holy spirit too is to impress the hearts of people about what is right what is wrong okay uh, in uh, and uh, because it says convict convict means to come to the realization of something you you realize hey this is sin this is righteousness and also of judgment. Judgment meaning uh, we we realize that hey, there is a God. We have to be accountable. We have to do the right thing. Okay, there is going to be uh, a judgment later on. So He awakens us to these realities, and that is the work of the Holy Spirit. That is why whenever we pray, right, we pray for people. We invite the work of the Holy Spirit, and we say. Earlier we saw Jesus said the father, he will draw when I'm lifted up, the father will draw all men to himself. So there is a work which the father does in bringing people into the kingdom, drawing them okay, to himself. Now there is a work which the Holy Spirit does to bring people to that awakening or realization that they are. Uh, are right or they are wrong or this is right and also there will be judgment so we invite the work of the holy spirit okay uh, and 
uh, he continues to you know reveal to them that this is what the holy spirit will do and then he says you know i want to say so many things to you um uh, but everything i'm unable to share maybe it had to do with the fact that they were still not the believers where the disciples were still not um, you know born again uh, the spirit had not holy spirit had not come and changed and transformed them yet it could have to do with the things of their uh, you know maturity so they were not able to receive much more than what jesus actually shared at that time so he's just saying look uh, there's so much that i want to actually tell you but you can't bear it okay right now but uh, here is again the advantage when i go away right and the holy spirit comes he the spirit of truth has come what else will he do he will guide you so he will teach you he will guide you and he will uh, not speak of his own authority but whatever he hears he will speak okay and he will tell you of the things to come so you can add to the functions of the holy spirit okay he is spirit of truth he teaches now he it says he will guide and he will also tell of the things to come meaning he will he knows right god is the one who is an omniscient god he knows all things and the holy spirit is his spirit who also knows all things and therefore the holy spirit is also able to reveal the future not only can he guide but he can also reveal the future okay so these are the functions or the role of the holy spirit and he says in addition to this you know he will glorify me uh, he will take of what is mine and declare it to you so jesus and the spirit are working closely with one another for each other so what is the role of the holy spirit he will glorify the lord jesus so anything that qualifies as a work of the holy spirit this is like a test how how can we test that uh, you know for gold when somebody says this is gold buy it from me we want to find out really is it is it gold okay give me the certificate you know does it say okay 24 whatever 23 carat gold like this like this. so there is a certificate we look for in the same way when we hear that something is the work of the holy spirit we look for a certification okay we look for uh, uh, the results and we can verify whether it is really from the holy spirit or not see holy spirit will not do anything which will put jesus down if something uh, is happening and it is bringing dishonor to the name of jesus we can straight away say this cannot be the work of the holy spirit because nowadays so many such things happen they say oh holy spirit told me or holy spirit came upon us that's why we did that uh, but holy spirit will never say or do anything which will dishonor jesus so his functions we have seen you add to that he will glorify jesus so he will only exalt and honor and uh, uh, magnify the lord jesus christ so that way we can know that something is truly the work of the holy spirit okay uh, so that gives us more clarity and you know you notice here the way jesus said i don't speak of my own authority but i speak as the father uh, i i speak as i hear from the father the holy spirit again he doesn't speak whatever he wants to but jesus is saying here that he will take of what is mine and declare it to you so he is also the way jesus is connected to the father now we see that the holy spirit is connected to jesus and uh, the holy spirit works in line with what jesus has already spoken and in line with glorifying of jesus now earlier remember we saw the statement where uh, jesus said the father is greater than i so there are people who have come up with teachings where they say no jesus is not god father is god uh, but jesus is just the son you know, don't uh, uh, try to worship him or anything but you see verse 15 here john 16 verse 15 all things that the father has are mine okay uh, 
what is how can this be you know if the father and the son are not equal so jesus is saying look i i am claiming everything whatever father has it's mine only okay uh, and he says look at the work of the spirit the spirit he will take what is mine and he will declare it to you so it's like a, a beautiful team of the father the son the holy spirit they respect one another there is a way in which they function you know the father is greater than i um uh, what uh, i speak of the father's authority the holy spirit will not speak of his own uh, his own self but he will take of what is mine and he will... so they are all, they are honoring the order within the godhead they are honoring one another their function you know nobody steps on another person's toes so to speak so we see that perfect unity we see that working together of the three equal persons of the godhead here okay so jesus is introducing and explaining much more about the holy spirit to the disciples because he knew that this would be better for them you know for all of them to receive the power of the holy spirit and the presence of the holy spirit then again you know he's reminding them he says a little while and you will not see me and again a little while and you will see me because i go to the father so basically he's talking about his death he's talking about his resurrection you know and uh, you could also say that he's talking about um uh, him going away ascending and returning for the second coming so he's letting them know these are the things that are going to happen so don't be unaware i'm giving you an idea okay i'm giving you an idea so when the disciples heard all this earlier they said where are you going jesus are you going to another city which uh, you you didn't tell us uh, about uh, but now more and more you know as he's saying i'm going to the father they have clarity Okay, that uh, yeah, something is is happening here. It's not just about going to another city, and yet the disciples did not understand fully. So he asked, they ask him this question, you know, uh, what is it? Why is he saying little while, and you will see me no more again a little while? What is this little while? Um, they they didn't get it clearly. So. Jesus realized these people want to find out something from me. So he he tells them, "Are you uh, inquiring among yourselves? Are you discussing among yourselves uh, a little about what I said? You know, little while I'll be there, little while I'll be gone. So uh, now, again, he tells them, you know, what I mean is, you are going to be very, um, you are going to be deeply distressed, or he says, you will weep and lament." weep and lament is uh, you know in a few, when somebody passes away okay and it is uh, uh, an untimely death or it is somebody um, did not fulfill all their years and they passed away have you seen people crying uh, at that time when people are shocked it's like weeping lamenting you know crying feeling sorry um, it's just like a deep sense of sorrow so he's saying look you don't understand the pain that you're all going to go through because the trial is going to start very soon so you will be in deep pain you will be weeping you'll be crying uh, you know you will be lamenting but you know he says the world will rejoice or at that time the world means what uh, the world is like the system of the world the people you know the unbelieving people the the uh, the arrangement right the arrangements in the world uh, and all of that so the world is going to be very happy and who is the person who uh, is ruling over the world satan so satan is going to be very happy so you see um, in what is going to take place there is again a natural reality and a spiritual reality so jesus is saying the spiritual reality i'm going to tell you soon but let me first tell you how these things are going to unfold so the trial will take place it's going to be painful but the people around are going to be very happy but you will be so you will be sorrowful but you know you know jesus doesn't leave them without hope 
He says, you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. So he's giving them hope while revealing to them that this is going to be a very tough situation. It's and he compares it, you know, it's just something like the lady who uh, is pregnant and uh, she's going into labor. Uh, she will be in a lot of pain. But as soon as the baby is born, you know, what do we see? That these mothers who give birth are rejoicing. They almost forget about the pain which they just joy overtakes you as compared to the pain of what one has gone through so he says similarly you know your sorrow will be turned into joy you will have sorrow but you know you will see uh, i will see you again and your heart will rejoice so he's talking about his resurrection okay jesus knows full well that uh, he is going to rise from the dead so he wants the disciples also to recognize that that uh, in the natural, they're going to kill me. But that is not the end. I'm going to rise from the dead. And that's where he says, your sorrow will turn into joy. You know, we who believe in, in God, we know that uh, what we are going to see is not the end. But there is the resurrection of Christ. There is the effect or the impact of the death of Christ, which has brought us the covenant blessings, right, of the cross. In uh, and uh, you know we have eternal life and so many other results from the death of Jesus. So actually, he wanted the believers to go through the natural with an understanding of the spiritual, because if that were not the case, they would also look at the events that unfold with their normal thinking and they will go into deep uh, depression that hey this jesus in whom we believe look at this he could not even save himself so how can we believe all the teachings that he has given us so he, he's encouraging them helping them to have a spiritual perspective again you know, earlier in John chapter 15, uh, as part of his encouragement, he said that if you abide in me, you will ask, uh, 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 you know, and you will ask the father and he will do it for you. Again, he is speaking about answered prayer. In verse 23 here, he says, in that day, you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, Whatever you ask the father in my name, he will give you. So he is talking about his death. Once he dies, okay, and he uh, uh, completes his work of redemption, our prayers, okay, are going to uh, have the power because of the name of Jesus. He says, if you ask the father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you have not asked in my name. But he's teaching, he's training and equipping them about how they need to pray once he has completed the work on the cross. So he says, you use, you use the authority of my name. I'm going to give it to you. You take it up and you will see answered prayer. So, you know, we've seen this in John uh, 14 once he encouraged them. Uh, to to seek God and that they will have answers to prayer. John 15, he says, if the word abides in you, then you ask whatever you want, you know, and the father will give it to you. Again, he says, now in my name, if you ask the father, he will give it to you. So all along, you know, he is talking about uh, the relationship with the Holy Spirit, which the believer will have. He's talking about the, uh, the authority in prayer, which the believer will have. Uh, so, there are a lot of encouraging things that he is bringing to their attention. Now, he uh, continues. Okay? He continues to share and equip and uh, prepare their hearts. So here he says, I've spoken to you these things in a figurative language, but the time is coming okay, when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. So in that day, you will ask in my name. 
and I do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. So he's talking about the, the um, authority that the believer can exercise in the name of Jesus okay, in prayer. So he also makes it very clear that, you know what, uh, when you pray, I am not saying that I am going to do your praying for you. Okay, because also, you know, sometimes we look at uh, the fact that Jesus is now in heaven. And the book of Hebrews says that he is the high priest forevermore. Uh, he is our intercessor. So he's sitting up in heaven and doing what? He is praying. Okay. But then here Jesus says, I do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you. So he's saying, look, I will do my task of praying in heaven, which is my talk, which is my job. I'll do it. But I am going to leave you in such a way that you are prepared with hope in your heart because you know that I'm coming back. And also I'm giving you the authority. You can pray directly to the Father. Okay. So I will do my praying. You please do your praying. You pray here on earth and how to pray. Pray in my name. Earlier he said, my words abide in you and you abide in me. Then you ask anything. I will do it for you. So he's saying that we are going to be very victorious in prayer. In all these three chapters, he says, you know, uh, we should pray. That we must pray directly. And how to pray? You know, sometimes people say that you have to pray to um, uh, a saint or you need to pray to, uh, you know, some mediator sort of a person. And then it will go to the Father. Or some people even say, no, no, you pray only to Jesus. Jesus will take it to the Father. But what is Jesus saying? He's saying, look, I do not say that I should, that I shall pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me. Okay. And have believed that I came forth from the Father. So he's saying you can be directly connected to the Father and you can reach out to the Father directly and he will answer your prayer. So that is again a privilege for every believer. Wow. We have the connection with the Holy Spirit. We have the connection with, with the uh, Son of God. We have the connection with the Father. And Jesus is making it possible because he is going to now die and he is going to buy our um, ransom. Okay, He is going to set us free in other words. And give us the authority. So that's the way in which you know Jesus encourages his disciples. He tells them of all the advantages, gives them the hope, uh, and he is uh, getting ready to go. Yeah. So he uh, again, you know, sort of uh, encourages them to remember that he has come from heaven, that they must uh, believe. They must truly believe in who he is and what he has said, you know, regarding the uh, things that are going to happen to him. So towards the end of this passage in John 16, he says, indeed, the hour is coming. Yes, has now come that you will be scattered each to his own and will leave me alone. And yet I'm not alone because the father is with me. So while going through his trial, you see the assurance that he has about his relationship and his connectedness to the Father. He says, I'm going to go through a very tough time, but I'm not alone. Okay, so he is quite strong in that. And he also knows that these people who are called his disciples, you know, they'll all uh, like, um, nobody will be standing with him or nobody will be able to help him. Uh, and in fact, they get scattered. Right? And we know about Peter. Jesus already told him what Peter, you know, you're saying you, you will not leave me uh, and you'll follow me. But before the, uh, you know, before morning, you're going to deny me three times. So there was no such benefit for Jesus from these disciples of his. But is he shaken in any way? No. What is the basis of his strength? He says, I'm not alone. The fa father is with me. 
and why did jesus share all this information with his disciples he says so that you may have peace in the world <coughs> excuse me you will have tribulation okay but be of good cheer i have overcome the world so three chapters here where uh, jesus wants the disciples to live above the events that are going to take place and to have a spiritual perspective of the events that will take place okay so that is the encouragement of jesus now we will see the prayers of jesus so he's going to pray he's going to pray for himself he's going to pray for his disciples he's going to pray for the believers okay and um, uh, in preparation he is going to go to the cross so before that there are all these prayers that he will pray so so far about the encouragement that jesus gives the disciples any anything that you want to add or anything that you know uh, uh touched you you just want to talk about it uh, i just thought i'll pause because continuously i'm talking so i hope uh, the pace is fine So if there is, you know, a thought that you have, you could just uh, share it with the class. Okay, doesn't look like uh, there's anything different that you probably want to share. So, uh, all right, let's just continue then. So here it's about the prayers of Jesus, um, and the first prayer which he prays, uh, you know, he he um, speaks to the Father, and he asks the Father. You know, he's saying, uh, Father. the hour has come remember earlier even when he was surrounded by the uh, opposers there were times when he told the disciples my time has not the hour has not come but now the understanding of the time for his own life and the events that need to take place you know, that is quite um, uh, that understanding is is quite clear for jesus so he he knew that soon he is going to die so the hour has come but what is this hour he is asking god to do what only he can do so he is saying glorify your son that is the prayer that jesus prays okay glorify your son uh, so that your son may glorify you but what exactly is going to happen jesus dying on the cross okay uh, so when jesus is dying on the cross why is he saying glorify your son see glorify your son uh, simply it means that you know whatever jesus is going to do he is doing it as an act of obedience uh, to what god has called him to do so whenever we do something that is an act of obedience it brings honor to god okay uh, and jesus is saying lord i am going to obey you you please bless my act of obedience and all the results of my act of obedience lord you know let that let that let that be done let that be accomplished you know let that um, honor be placed uh, upon what i am doing so that is what jesus is saying you glorify your son Okay, so that your son may glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. So he wants God's blessing on uh, the work that he is going to do, and then he says that let there be a fulfillment. 
okay uh, of what god had originally intended which is that god wants to give eternal life to the people who will trust in jesus let all those things take place father you know and you you lift up or you honor the work which i am going to do for you yeah so that is uh, essentially the main you know part of the prayer glorify me is is what jesus is praying over here uh, and you know he continues to add here um, that i have glorified you on the earth and i have finished the work which you have given me to do so he is also confident that he has uh, been faithful to the call of god upon his life you know who else says i have finished the race you know i have fought a good fight paul paul the apostle so you see when it comes to each one of our lives there is a purpose there is a work i have finished the work uh, for which god has called us and from the life of jesus from his example this is what we can take back no we have to do what god has called us to do we can't leave it midway okay uh, and uh, jesus is standing at the end of all the things that have happened to him and his lifetime of ministry he's standing there and he's saying confidently that i have finished you know the work which you have given to me so now father glorify me glorify me okay uh, another aspect of understanding glorify me is one is that the plan of god will be released okay that you know that that uh, authority which he gave that eternal life which is going to come from jesus sacrifice all those things will be released and also the glorify me means that the original glory which jesus had in heaven you know we say that when he was here on the earth he walked with sonship glory but in heaven he had another kind of glory right so jesus is saying uh, you please give me that glory god glorify me together with yourself with the glory which i had with you before the world was so he is asking for that glory as well okay so this is the prayer of jesus for himself so he is just praying that there will be a fulfillment of the work that god has called him to do uh, he is acknowledging that he has completed the work which god has called him to do and he is also saying that you know uh, he wants to get back that original glory which he had before he came here on the earth so now let's see let's see what he prays for his disciples uh, would somebody like to quickly read uh, this passage please i think it will be easy i'll just share the summary out of it and that way uh, it's faster for us instead of going you know word by word line by line so anyone can you read it it's not very long a long uh, passage Okay, who is able to read the passage? Uh, Dev, is it possible to read? Okay. Okay, nobody is it? All right. So, let me let me do that then. I'll just quickly read the passage and then I'll just share the uh, mm, uh, the key key points. So, uh, Jesus is prayer for his disciples. He says I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world they 
were yours you gave them to me and they have kept your word now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you for i have given to them the words which you have given me and they have received them and have known surely that i came forth from you and they have believed that you sent me i pray for them i do not pray for the world but for those whom you have given to me for they are yours and all mine are yours and yours are mine and i'm glorified in them now i am no longer in the world but these are in the world and i come to you holy father keep through your name those whom you have given to me that they may be one as we are while was with them in the world i kept them in your name those whom you gave me i have kept them and none of them is lost except the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled but now i come to you and these things i speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves i have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world just as i am not of the world i do not pray that you should take them out of the world but that you should keep them from the evil one they are not of the world just as i am not of the world sanctify them by your truth your word is truth as you sent me into the world i also have sent them into the world and for their sakes i sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth okay so that is the passage regarding the believers so i'll just quickly summarize so in this passage you uh, we are seeing that um, uh, he basically you know he's talking about uh, his relationship with the disciples how the father gave them to him and that he has spoken his word uh, into their hearts uh, and you know that they are following him one person we know judas iscariot you know who uh, turned the way uh, and followed the prompting of uh, satan but there are at least three three verses here where he very clearly prays for specific things for the disciples so one thing he says this mm, uh one second keep yeah he says keep through your name those whom you have given me so that is one prayer he prays for the disciples meaning lord that they should stay with you they should not go away from you going away could happen because of discouragement um you know uh, disobedience so many so many ways but his prayer for them is so far they've come lord they should stay and they should complete the way he said right that i have finished my work they should be able to finish the work and that is his prayer for them and then he prays for them and he says that um uh, don't i'm not saying that you take them out of this world because it's a very difficult world full of sin full of disobedience to you but he prays that these people should be protected from the devil okay remember he had prayed for protection uh, uh, for peter as well he knew that peter is going to fall but he had prayed for protection he had prayed that god would strengthen peter so he's actively praying for his disciples and he's saying that you know oh god keep them in your name please protect them keep them i'm not telling that uh, because this world is so dangerous you remove them from the world but even if they are in the world lord you know i want you to keep them from the evil one so mainly protection he is praying for protection over them and then he also says that god you are able to clean them or sanctify them cleanse them how does a work of cleansing take place in us no he says sanctify them by your truth you know if you go to ephesians there in ephesians 5 we see that christ will purify the church you know for his return and this church will be a glorious church how is jesus going to clean the church with the word so when the word is spoken when the word is ministered to the people when the word begins to work in our hearts cleaning cleansing you know takes place so that's what jesus is saying he's saying lord let the word be uh, upon their lives first of all you protect them in this world you keep them so that they will finish their journey and god i am also praying that you will clean them up with the truth of your word you sent me into this world i am sending them into uh, the world 
okay uh, so you you please purify them you protect them and the intention that jesus had see when you read this passage you no know, uh, the very clear intention that jesus has is the disciple should represent him in the world okay so he about himself he said i'm not of the world and you see in this passage he also says about his own disciples that they are also not of the world so he recognizes that you know, these people uh, are his followers and they have to live a life which you know is is like him from above so he wants his disciples to be examples and protected by god cleaned by the word of god so that is his prayer for the disciples now let's see what he is praying for the believers i'll quickly read it and then summarize it up i do not pray that for these alone but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they all may be one as you father are in me and i in you that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that you sent me and the glory which you gave me i have given them that they may be one just as we are one i in them and you in me that they may be made perfect in perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me father i desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where i am that they may behold my glory which you have given me for you loved me before the foundation of the world o righteous father the world has not known you but i have known you and these have known that you sent me and i have declared to them your name and will declare it that the love with which you loved me may be in them and i in them okay so it's quite evident you know here again he is basically talking about unity okay so for the believers who are to come so far he prayed for the disciples disciples who were alive with him at that time and we saw all the aspects of prayer that he prayed yes there was uh, a prayer where he prayed that they will also be one or they will be united but he makes this point uh very strongly for the people who are going to believe in him which is you and me so he wants the believers who are going to uh, you know the in the coming generations that they will display unity because when they display unity what does it show it shows that we are representing the unity of the godhead you, know, you saw right all the verses which say that i am in you you are in me god in the same way you know, let them let them be united so this unity of the godhead is revealed through the believers and that is what jesus wanted from the believers you know when we look at our uh, uh, lives today uh, we may be from different denominations we may be from different uh, experiences in our christian walk so uh, we may be from different backgrounds but jesus desired that we should all be one or in other words that we display unity because when we display unity what happens that the world may know so how is the world going to know that we are disciples of jesus through our unity okay to our unity so verse 21 i'll quickly read it that they all may be one as you father are in me and i in you that they also may be one in us so not just being one with one another or united with one another but our main unity is obviously with the godhead okay so that we can never lose our connection with god you know sometimes we are more connected to people than to god that is not correct either we have to be united in spirit with the brothers and sisters in christ but that unity should come from our unity with god himself okay so this kind of connection being united to god being united to uh, the brothers and sisters in christ that reveals to the world uh, you know who god is and the world is able to believe so the last part of verse 21 it says that the world may believe that you sent me 
okay, that the world may believe that you sent me. So if we want the world to believe uh, that Jesus is the Messiah, believers have to display unity. So you see how important it is, unity. We've talked about this when we spoke about the citywide church. We've talked about this, uh, you know, uh, when we talked about kingdom builders, we have a kingdom mindset, okay? Uh, that we maintain that honor and help one another and remain connected. So this is what Jesus prayed for the believers. And of course, you know, once again, he emphasizes, John um, shows us here, in Jesus' prayer, he prays about the kind of love that Jesus has for us. You know, it's uh, that uh, it's it's a precious love, and that uh, also, you know, he prays for the he lets the believers know that they will be with him. You gave the Father gave us to Jesus, and we are at one point going to be with him okay so he describes that relationship here okay so uh, that is what he prays for the believers and also you might uh, uh, notice here that he talks about another he talks about the glory with which these believers must walk on the earth one is unity second is glory and the glory which you gave me i have given them that they may be one just as we are one. So what is that glory? You know, we said earlier that sonship glory. Jesus walked with sonship glory. So he wanted us also to walk with that same sonship glory with authority and dominion here on the earth. Okay, So those are uh, some of the key prayers that uh, are coming out of these passages. But uh, I would encourage us to read, you know, word by word and line by line because there is so much depth in it. But we don't, we have only a couple of weeks to go. And that's the reason I kind of, you know, quickly just summarize the passages for uh, all of us. All right, let's 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 pray and close. I think some of your other classmates had to leave. So that's okay. Uh, we will pray and we'll close. Uh, Kiran, could you also pray and close now, if you don't mind? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, sure. Father, we just come, yeah. Father God, we just come before your throne, Father God. Thanking you, Father God, for revealing that all words, Father God, that uh, today we learn, Father God. Father God, thanking you that that sunset glory, Father God. Thanking you, Father God, to just Christ as example, Father God, to our life, Father God, to walk to your kingdom work, Father God. Thanking you, the Holy Spirit also, Father God. Thanking you all things, Father God. Thanking you all things. I'm just submitting to your hand upcoming test of test, Father God. Thanking you. Almighty Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Kiran. Thank, Thank you, everyone. So God bless you. And uh, yeah, hopefully, let's see. I'll try to finish in the next class. Uh, if it doesn't get over, then maybe, you know, the following week. But otherwise, yeah, we'll try to finish soon. Okay. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.